You're listening to Lunch with the Finance Bunch, bringing money talk you can understand. Ooh, DJ Bander, we have somebody wonderful in the studio today. I've we been do indeed. anticipating this. It's a friend, you know, and her name is Brittany Castro. How you doing, Brittany? I'm good. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, Brittany and I go back a little ways. And I so, can't remember how long. Right? Oh, my goodness. Since 25? 15? Okay, not yeah. Okay, four, five. Four, yeah. five years, yeah. And I've been watching your progress. Yeah. So you've been doing a lot. Yes, I've been busy. (laughs) So I wanted to just um, tell everyone in our audience just a little bit about you before we get started. So Brittany Castro is the owner and founder of Financially Wise, Inc., right? Yes. And Brittany has been in the financial sector since 2006. She has owned her own company since 2013. She has gone from employee to entrepreneur. And Brittany was a student who is now the teacher financial planning. She's a spokesperson. She's partnered with a prominent financial institution called Chase Bank, like we don't know which one that is, right, as a financial advisor. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, too. And she's a social media influencer. She even has a rap video about money for kids, which is awesome. Okay, okay. (laughs) One of Brittany's (laughs) most recent accomplishments is being talked about in Gary Vee's book, Crushing It. She's considered by Gary Vee to be a person to keep your eyes on. Brittany's approach to um, finance is completely out of the box, but within the financial watchdog's guidance, right? So you're like outside of the norm, but not to the point that you're not compliant. So that's really important, and I love that about you. Also, Brittany is financially savvy and a successful businesswoman in her own right, Brittany loves helping others to become financially successful. So that's why we wanted you on the show. It's so good to have you here. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to jump right into the questions. And the first question that we had for you is, what made you decide to start a financial company? (laughs) (laughs) It's a good question. Um, So for those people who don't know my story, I started at a financial planning company out of college. And I was there for about four and a half years. Mm. And I was, quote unquote, successful but also i wasn't happy and you know i was 22 when i first started Mm -hmm. so being 22 and a woman in finance you kind of stick out like a sore thumb yes and so as much as that was such a foundational part of my journey because i got great training how to be a financial planner how to market how to run a business i also learned that I wanted more freedom and independence to do my own version of this. I always had an idea to have my own business and be entrepreneur. I didn't even know what that word meant, though. (laughs) Um, So anyway, I just looked at my life and I realized I can't work 60 plus hours a week and hustle and grind. And I was operating under this what I call a more masculine model of success, which Mm -hmm. is that forcing and grinding and hustling. And it worked, but I wasn't. happy Happy. and I wasn't healthy I was sick a lot my body was telling me something was off so I left and went to an independent company for about a few years and I really used that as a stepping stone to eventually launch my own company so the, the decision to launch my own company about six years ago was mainly because I wanted that complete freedom to launch all these ideas I had and the vision I had of how I wanted to be known in this space, which was more of a financial expert, not just an advisor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do both. I wanted to help individuals, but I also wanted to be more in the media, in the front, you know, as a change maker or just leading the Mm -hmm. way for specifically women at that time to say, look, there's another way. You don't have to follow this old traditional model that doesn't right. make sense for you or you can't relate to. And quite frankly, like any entrepreneur journey, you kind of just leap and go for it. I had no idea you exactly. know, what I was really signing up for. And that's around the time when we met. Because yeah. when we met, we had long talks about that. Like, I want to do this my way. Mm-hmm. You know, I know that people out there want a different approach to it. And we were kind of in sync with that because I was thinking like, you know, this is the 99% do not do business like the 1%. Exactly. And they're the ones who need our help. And so for you to target and understand that, you know, at my age and in my age group and women and, you know, families too, they need a different approach to the way they listen to or learn about how to be financially savvy. 
And so when you took that on as your plight, I was like, whoa, look at this girl. And then I want to know a little bit about that rap video, because that's where we started. Because <laughs> you did a full rap video yeah, for kids. Yeah, that was, okay, so that was fun. <laughs> I totally forgot about that, by the way. I had a consulting client at the time called Next Gen Startups, and mm -hmm. they were producing content to help the next generation of entrepreneurs. And they wanted to create some finance content. And I said, look, let me, let me create a music video. Right. So, I mean, it's like I'm a dancer, so it's always a dream of mine to have some sort of video. And they approved it. And I don't think he really knew what he was, like the owner was signing You're up right. for. Anyway, I had the whole production team. We mapped it all out. We created these lyrics, yeah. which is, I had an assistant at the time who helped me learn how to rap, which was not easy, by the way. I'm not right. a singer, but I can understand a music from a dance Perspective, mind, uh -huh. but the whole rapping, I have so much respect for them because I didn't realize how hard it was. Anyway, we made that video and uh, it went out and it was so much fun. Yeah, you and, can tell you were having fun doing it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and know? it really was, you know, it was a point in my career. I, I just was so over the seriousness of finance right. and everyone's so stuffy about totally. it. Yes. And I remember when that came out, because I still work with individual clients, a mm -hmm. lot of people in the financial industry hear of my name and kind of keep track of what I'm up to. Right. And I had a few financial advisors reach out to me and say, oh, this is this is unprofessional or, you know, the hey, their feedback, which right. you always get if you're doing exactly. anything, you get feedback. But then I thought, yeah, that's exactly what I want you to say because it wasn't for, for you. you. That's right. I didn't make the video for financial advisors. Right, right. You well, made it for And there's kids. such a need for approachability in finance. Yeah. Exactly. You know, we talk about that a lot on this show, you know, and like I was curious too, is, is that sort of, you know, I think it's really interesting too that you, you're, you're financially wise women, right? Yeah. And I think that's really cool because I know, for example, that unfortunately in society, women more often than men mm -hmm. are discouraged so much to become financially literate. So why'd you come up with that name and like what led you to want to put a little bit more emphasis on building financial stability for women in society, which I think is great. By the Thank way. you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, originally it was because I was a woman in finance and I started to pick up on this trend that I didn't even relate to the mm -hmm. people in my industry. Right. And when I would work with clients, if they were in a relationship, the woman would always ask me questions around life. Is this, do I, do we have enough? Are we going to be okay? Mm -hmm. It wasn't about standard deviation of the portfolio or mm -hmm. risk or beta, all these terms that you're taught to speak to with your clients about. And I just started to talk to all these women clients and pick up on the trend. And I think it was just kind of perfect timing in terms of opportunity with where women are at in history and right. being in LA and having opportunities to be a business owner myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember I wanted to create a blog to help women with money and be mm -hmm. similar to finance or fashion and beauty blogs that I saw women starting to really do. And right. these videos on YouTube were really picking up. And I talked to my mom and we we're coming up with names. And anyway, we we're just playing with words and we put the financially wise women together and we we both felt, yep, that That's nailed it. it. And then I, you know, registered it. And now last year we actually evolved the brand. So we're Financially Wise Inc. Mm -hmm. And that was a decision mainly because of course, helping women is always going to be part of our story and passion, but also we do help a lot of clients and we don't want to just say we're just for women, women only and yeah. kind of separate and right. play into that whole thing yeah. that comes with that. We wanted to say, no, men and women both need to be financially right. wise. And let's start to talk about it in a way that empowers both and doesn't mm -hmm. put down one or the exactly. other and all that. And also, I noticed you you say like in your rap video itself, you know, I think you have a, I think a line like, don't depend on a man or something. <laughs> right. Like it's not a financial plan. It's oh, not a financial <laughs> I, I love that. I think that's great. I mean, not, I, I think obviously we're getting to a point where there is a new popularity of women to be financially independent, but I think it's good for both men and women to hear that, Yes, you know, exactly. because it's not just like, we, it's not just about the women who need to learn to not be dependent on men. It's also men needing to not let, not try to make their women dependent on them financially, which exactly. is also a reverse dichotomy that happens a lot. So I yeah, thought that was really cool. Yeah. It's interesting to hear your perspective as a man. Yeah, and a part of it is, of course, I'm actually very traditional in relationships. Like I right. do want a man to 
pay. And I know that's you're, kind you're with of, the flowers and wine. Yeah, pay, of course. For sure. Pay for dinner. But at the same time, I think just because of where we're at, at in society, women do have that power to be self-sufficient and independent. And then you can really enjoy a relationship in a whole different right. way. And I've just seen it so much where women say I'm not good or my husband takes care of it. And you just never know what life has in store. Divorce, death, you know. And, and everybody gets tired of paying all the bills. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I think that's something that's whether it's a man or a woman. Like when, yeah. when one, I think do when, when, it's not how much the total amount is of which partner spends the most, but the idea that like, well, everybody's doing what they can. That, it's a, yeah. that everybody's being a team player. You know, relationships are, it's a team sport. But it it's also gives sport. women a voice, mm -hmm. you know, within the For financial sure. industry, right? It gives them a voice and the ability. That's lightning and thunder that outside, is lightning by the way. Oh my God, thunder is going that? going on outside. I can just so feel people, it yeah. Just so people know that, you right. know, the radio this station did not blow up. Right, it's But Monday. the world is blowing up around us, just so, just so you all are aware. Exactly. Oh, we need to start that question again. That was you great. Know? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Right, it just like happened like so dramatically, right? That was. <laughs> We, we must be saying some powerful things. Heck yeah, Mother we should use this picking up. We should use that for the <laughs> intro, right? <laughs> so, so how did you come with your strategy from going? Because I love these stories. Um, you know, um, I have a I have a dear friend who literally started as a busboy at Ruth Chris Steakhouse, and now yeah. is the general manager. And I love these stories of the still the belief in the the. Um, climbing the ladder and making yourself independent, you, you know, through mm -hmm. capitalism, the capitalism hasn't died, that that's not an impossibility. So how did you make that pivot, you know, um, from em employee to being like, you know what, okay, I'm going to, did you gather enough resources? Did you save? So you had like a little bit of a, of a, you know, capital to work with to start your own business? How'd that, how'd that work? Great question. So yeah, when I left the first company to be Frank, I was never a quote unquote employee. Like I was, but I was always responsible for making my own income. So I've never mm -hmm. really had that mindset of salary, W-2, work right. nine to five. So I think that did help a ton make the transition easier in the sense of, yeah, it's up to me basically to make it happen mm -hmm. financially. Um, but yes, I also did save quite a significant amount in my cushion, like my cash account, and then also my retirement funds, which I ended up, which is like considered a big no-no in finance. I ended up using that for the first few years of my business because, I mean, looking back, I've probably wasted so much money, but that's kind of part of the process. Right. I think you put capital, you have to pay for things, you know, even just registering as a financial firm took money to hire the attorney. Um, but it's not a waste because you've built a brand. Yeah, exactly. thank you. And I now I'm way more accepting of it. But I remember I felt so much guilt for doing that. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't have the awareness to go. Like, I remember asking for a small business loan and I got denied because they said, well, you you need P&Ls. You know? right. And so it was like that catch 22 that I'm sure a lot of people face. Um I mean, looking back, I would have probably done it so many different ways, but mm -hmm. that was my journey. And that's what I've learned to really self-fund everything I've done, which I guess is really cool too, because I've realized I've taken on this level of risk and I've always been okay with that. It was a very conscious thing. And mm -hmm. even though it wasn't always comfortable, okay, where's my next client? Where's my next paycheck coming from? Right. You know, I used all my savings. I've used my retirement accounts. Now what? Am yeah. I just setting myself up for failure you know sure. but now i can see oh here it is here's the investment it's really starting to pay off and show me that return no i think that's great i think that's the thing that we like to emphasize on this right. show a lot you know Shar and i are always talking about how you know especially with young people you know in your 20s to 30s is this great opportunity in time to you know you can take the risk to try investing in your business yes. now it's you know um and, you know, when you're much, much older, you know, towards your 70s and 80s, you don't really, you can't do those kinds of things. So now's the time to kind of try to shoot the three-pointer shot because, <laughs> you know, if it doesn't work, you can always go back to the grind, you know, and go the traditional route. Um, and I always say, you know, um, there's, it's much better to, you know, regret what you tried than regret what you didn't. So I think that's great, you know. Yeah, I do too. And I think that, you know, when you start out at a young age, and this is really good for our listeners to know that there is some risk involved when you decide you want to be an entrepreneur. Of course. And you should, you know, make sure that you save money so that you have 
the money to invest in what you're trying to accomplish so that you don't have to stop. But I also think that, like you said, Brittany, it's really important when you start out to have the vision. And even if it's not completely plain to you exactly where it's going to end up, to at least start with a vision and start with a gut feeling of knowing that mm-hmm. this is something that I want to accomplish, right? This is something that I need to do. So I like that. You know, when we come back, we're not going to break yet, but I want to talk to you a lot about how you got a partnership with Chase Bank mm-hmm. and all of that as their ambassador, and then how you got it mentioned, not just mentioned, but you've got your own section of Mr. Gary V's book. I want to talk about that too. And so when where Zach left off at, you had just you know gotten into your business and, and moving your vision forward. How do you attract companies to want to partner with you? Hmm. Good question. Well, going back to earlier, I've always been a planner and a visionary. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a huge part of it. I've always known, like, here's the big picture. And part of my work has has been actually to really learn to enjoy exactly where where I'm at now and trust the process, which I'm so much better at now because of just experience. But For example, when I started the company, I knew I wanted to be a financial expert in media. So that was very clear. I I wrote out dream partners, brands that I would want to work with um, that would be in alignment with our philosophies and messaging. And they weren't actually financial brands. They were more like I remember, of course, Oprah, you know, yes. like all these brands that we wanted to mimic in the sense of, oh, what are we going to stand for? So then I think in terms of um, just getting companies to recognize me, it's just been consistency, developing content and pushing out that content on a regular basis. Like I've never paid for PR. Everything's been organic. Yeah. Actually, in the beginning, I would meet with a lot of PR agencies and I just couldn't fathom paying somebody four grand a month right. to help me get a magazine article when magazines would reach out to me and ask me to be in the article for free. And totally. I think that was because I kept pushing out content every week right. on, on our blog and then social media and organically that gets your name out there and if you're just consistent people start to become aware and we I've always just been really aware of the brand and what are we standing for in our marketing and I love that side of it so Uh I think it's been fun for me but yeah I mean part of these corporate gigs that I get is about oh a thought I want to work with companies now (laughs) that's how kind of the chase thing happened I realized oh I think I want to work with financial institutions again but from a different level, from a level of helping them at the big picture strategy. How are they reaching their consumers and what can I offer and bring to the table in terms of my value or my unique skills so that we can partnership? And again, it was just perfect opportunity because that's the way marketing is done now, influencer marketing. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So when we come back, we're gonna talk more about your partnership with Chase and Mr. Gary V. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah, I'm Charlene. And I am DJ Bander. And we're on Lunch with the Finance Bunch on Dash, Dash Talk, Talk X. X. And this is Charlene and Zach over there, my co-host, and we're back on Dash Talk X. And we have Ms. Brittany Castro in our studio today. And we're talking about finance, we're talking about media, we're talking about partnerships, and the, just the success that you've obtained so far. So I want to jump back into something we left off with, and that is your partnership with Chase, how that came about and where you are now with it. Yes. So how that came about was probably, well, when I started the company six years ago, right away, um, within the first year, I started consulting with that firm, Next Gen um, yes. Startups. And I really like that because I was consulting on a level of marketing and developing content. And so I thought, oh, I want to continue doing this kind of work in addition to the other things that I was creating and launching with the company. Um, And then I think the decision for me came soon after a few years with that contract was, oh, I think there's opportunity for me to go back to the financial world and consult with them on a, on a level too. And personally it was, I was just over that. um, I had a lot of resentment toward Mm -hmm. the financial industry for a while. And I think I finally just got over it. Like I did what I needed to do um, to see it on the other side. And then I thought, well, now there's opportunity actually for me to go and leverage my unique perspective and the way things I, and the, 
you know, envision them to be moving right. forward. And I just put it out in the universe. And then there was um, a few contract opportunities that came before Chase. And I remember thinking, that one doesn't feel right. And, you know, it's hard mm-hmm. to say no to right. things, but this is also part of success. You really have to be true to who you are and what your brand is. That's right. But I said no to these few because they weren't in alignment. Like I could never honestly recommend that company. I wouldn't normally do it. So I said no. And then Chase, I think, was the third one that came. And it was just kind of serendipitous. They the PR company emailed me and I said, great. And I kind of I was so detached from it. Yeah. Like I didn't put any uh I don't know how to say it. Like I'm when you become detached from things is yes. usually when they finally they stick. finally <laughs> step in. Yes. Totally. Yeah. Um, so I was so detached, and I said, "Great!" And, and then it all just kept progressing, and so now we're going to be working in year four together, which is very exciting, and um, it's been great. Honestly, Chase as a brand is so forward thinking with how and and just working with their Chase. Um, department and then in addition to the PR team that I work with it just so happens that most of them are women which is really cool cool. Um, and I just thought oh this is so fun to see how far we've progressed Progressed. like now we're all just women talking about how do we market and help people more with financial education and creating content that will bring them value and and so it's been so much fun that's awesome so switching gears a little bit Brittany what I wanted to ask you about is as you know, recently, earlier this year, we had this whole government shutdown and it kind of put the spotlight a lot on the vulnerability financially of Americans yes. today. And, um, you know, one thing that's something that Shar and I are trying to discover um, to help our listeners is what's going on with that, you know? And I was wondering, why do you think statistically it shows that 70 to 80% of Americans don't have more than $500 in savings, can't afford an emergency beyond that? Do you think that it's, um, more, would you say that it's more because of issues in terms of wages, inequality in society, or do you think there's a little bit of personal responsibility and people's spending habits that are to blame, or is it a combination of the two? I think it's a little bit of both. And I mm-hmm. think it's a little bit of society and the financial industry as a whole, mm. specifically making sure that, you know, some of this information doesn't get to people. Right. And yes, that um, part. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot as I'm creating content for 2019 and I'm thinking, what are we going to stand for now? Like, what's our, met- how do we keep evolving what we're educating people on? What do I need to grow on mm-hmm. in financially and how can I translate that to the rest of the people who follow us? Um, right. I think a lot of it is looking within and deciding, I want to learn how to manage my money. I think that's step one because mm-hmm. anything in life you can really achieve if you make that decision to take it into your own responsibility and it yes. and you can't continue to use that victim voice and i think mm. giving people that power and telling them and inspiring them and co- being with them where they're at is really where it's going to change mm-hmm. um yeah i think there's a reality in terms of wages and all of that but i think a lot of it just comes down to getting the education and feeling empowered and having people continue to share their stories and give you resources so that you too feel it's possible mm-hmm. and i think anytime I like for me i hear a story about someone i think oh well if they could do it i could do it too and exactly. it's relating to them at that level and reminding them that they do have that power no matter what their financial situation is to change it and Mm -hmm. and you know provide those resources to help them to that point what do you think of financial apps that are supposed to help with these sort of saving goals i mean one you know recently watching squawk alley i saw the ceo of acorn come on oh yeah and he was talking they're doing incredibly well they just made a partnership with nbc and I was just curious as to, um, do you think that's the future of where finance is going and helping to secure? Because what we're talking about is much more, it's not a micro problem of the individual investor. I mean, we're really talking about a macro crisis. You know, um, you know, part of the reason, you know, that, you know, America has trouble struggling financially is just that is the spending power of the working and middle class. So I was just wondering what you thought about about apps like Acorn and that, and what do you think about that whole field of applications? I think they're great. You know, I actually used to know someone who worked there, and mm. um, it was really interesting. There's a lot of them, and I think there's always 
the, we call them robo advisors, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the industry. And I think that it's great to leverage technology to help you save or manage your budget or invest. Um, and a lot of times for, for us, it's about, yeah, because if we do that, it'll save you fees. And mm. that's really important for people to know. But I also think there's always going to be a level of personal touch like yeah. for example we always put our value in the fact that yeah let's leverage those products or services that are going to make your life easy but you still need a professional to help you select and educate you on which one's going to be best for you zach to versus totally. you you That's know because right. there's right. so yeah. many different versions of apps and another part is with the automated apps especially with budgeting i always tell clients it's great i think those are fine but it doesn't replace the fact that you still need to get in there and understand what your cash flow is totally. and feel connected to your money so that you can make conscious decisions because what we usually find is people set up these apps especially budgeting apps and they use it it's like a diet they use it for a month or two and then they stop paying attention because it's all automated so you don't right. have to do anything you know there's a level of old school like get in there know what you're doing know what you're spending and especially with investing Great, if you wanna use one of those investing apps, more power to you, but don't also then just rely right. on that and give them all the power and and then five years later say, well, I didn't know that was happening and totally, you know, mistakes were made or something like that. Yeah, that's the part about it that I'm not comfortable with. And I'm, I'm in agreement with you that there's this personal element in finance that needs to remain in place because the average person doesn't even know where to start. Right. Exactly. Right. And so that's the question. It's like when I was asking people like, you know, Brittany's coming on, you know, what do you want me to ask her? The biggest question was, where do I start? Like, how do I get? And it's like watching Double Dutch. Right. And you don't know how to jump <laughs> in and where to get started. And, the, and it seems exactly. like the rope is turning faster and faster. So that's the simple question that people have. Brittany, how do people get started? Honestly, just make one step, step. to learn something new. Yes. And that could be literally reading an article about budgeting today. Yes. Like make it super small and tangible. I always think about that analogy. I don't know how it works, but anyway, small steps lead to big results. And course, it really, absolutely. it's like a daily thing. It's not that, oh my God, now I have to learn how I'm going to create a million dollars for retirement. And then you right. panic and get paralyzed by all the options. And then so you do nothing. Right. The whole thing is just do something, even if it feels so small that it's not going to matter. It really does matter because it's the accumulation of all those steps that really Over adds up. Time. And it gives you more um, power, I think, like specifically when you're learning about budgeting. OK, look, the reality is. No matter how much money you have, you have to learn how to budget. That's like right. it, just because you have a billion dollars or a million dollars doesn't eliminate the fact that you don't need to pay attention. You actually probably need to pay attention even more, even more. Exactly. because there's, you know, all these n numbers and things could be missing or unaccounted for. So, you know, stop also believing the illusions or the myths that your your budget's going to be perfect and everything's mm. going to be great right. and, and then you're going to have a cushion and then save for retirement and everything's going to be dandy and it doesn't work that way. Well, it's right. so psychological, it's, it isn't is. it? I mean, one thing that I think is about is, you know, we're trying to get people to not see money like water, like it, like trying to step back and look at it much more from a, from a bird's eye view. Um, and not see just like, okay, money comes in, then I want these things. And turning the excitement from these new shoes or this vacation or this new jacket to look at how much money's in my account. Like the excitement should be exactly. shifted to shifted. seeing how high your bank account number can get. Like that should be making you smile in the morning, not looking down at the sneakers that are gonna get worn out, you're gonna throw away anyway. And there's a balance I love too, that you said that. right? It is, mm -hmm. it, and there's also this balance mm -hmm. that needs to happen. Because I think another challenge that people have is that they feel like it's all or nothing. Right. You know, I'm either saving and I'm doing the right thing or I'm spending and blowing my money. And there needs to be this delicate balance. Life which, is which a gray is, area. Exactly. Which is where the human being comes in so that they can help guide you from where you are to where you want to be. And so I love the apps. But like you said, they're great for what they're worth. But there still needs to be this human element where people can take you because where Charlene is at today at my age and where Zach is at today at his age is com two completely different places. Mm -hmm. And if you look at an app, it's not going to distinguish 
my age unless I have to put my age in it to tell you what I need to do over the next 10 years versus Zach over the next 30. You or know, all the different variables. All the different that make variables. You, that's right. And that your money up. story, your money, you know, vices. You know, everybody's right. so unique that exactly. there's no one no size one size fits all. all so, which I know is cliche. So we're right. spending a lot of time focusing on the fiscal goals of young Americans in society. What's the next fiscal goal for Brittany Cash? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, I was just talking to my girlfriend about it. Buy property. So no, there we yeah. Go. yeah. Okay, now we're so talking. for a long time, I was investing in obviously the stock market and then my business. So now the next thing for me is to oh. Think the about mortgage, property, and I think, oh, this is a great time because save a lot of money. That's so right. when the next down hits, I'm ready to buy. There you go. Um, so I have a good group of girlfriends who we always like inspire each other. So we, it's not like an investment club, but kind of like that, right. right? You know. So we're all saying, yeah, let's start saving more, so then so we could have can. extra money for that time. That's great. I love that. That is perfect. So Brittany, within the next five years, what would you like to be doing? <laughs> Aside from I buying know. property. Oh, gosh. You know, life is a mystery, to be honest. I've learned to surrender to what what, happens. what comes. Yeah. Um, of course, I would love to still be doing. I'm a, I feel like I'm always going to be doing some sort of entrepreneur thing mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. just in me. I've learned to embrace that and honor it. I would like to have a family, buy property. I've actually thought a lot about in addition to my company financially wise and continuing to do the clients and paid, you know, partnerships mm -hmm. and speaking gigs, you know, we're launching an online membership to help more people at a lower price point. So that's something. Right. But in addition to all of that, even this idea of having my own dance studio, you know, something completely out of finance, finance. Um, or maybe I'll decide I really like the real estate thing and just buy a lot of properties and manage them. Who really knows? That's you know? right. I like that because what you're showing people is that you don't have to stay in one lane, that you can diversify, mm -hmm. you know, and that's really what diversification is about, exactly. right? Yeah, we preach is, that a lot over here. Exactly. Is having more than one lane, one sh more than one stream of income, and all of it doesn't have to be so serious. No. Some of it can be the things that you enjoy, like dance, a dance yeah. studio, right? Or invest in, in multiple properties and yeah. be a landlord, you know, in the truest sense of it. And to be honest, you know, also who really knows where my life will take me to. This so too, I think that's a big part for entrepreneurs who, you know, who maybe feel, I don't know. I don't even know five years from now. It's like, it's, it's okay. You right. don't have to know five years from now where you're going to be. And actually <laughs> probably where you think you're going to be, you're not going to be there at all. So don't worry about it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> have a vision. I, I have a great mentor and she always says, create a plan and throw it out and live in the present moment. I like that. Exactly. I love that too. So when we come back, we're going to talk more to Brittany Castro about what's going on in her life. I actually want to know what does a day in the life of Brittany look like? So how about we come back and start there? Sounds yes. Good. Okay. Juicy. <laughs> Lunch with the Finance Bunch on Dash Talk X. I'm Charlene. And I am DJ Bander. And we'll be right back. <laughs> and we're back in the studio with my co-host, DJ Bander. Yes, I'm yes. I'm Charlene. And we are having a conversation with Miss Brittany Castro. And I want to know what a day in the life of Brittany looks like. What does that look like? That's such a juicy question. It's always <laughs> different. Um, I'll give you an idea. So just business-wise, usually Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays is when I'm seeing clients. So those are pretty full in terms of my work day. Yes. Client meetings or calls or connections. Um, Mondays are usually my days with my team and business development. And then Thursdays, I actually just take off um, as much as I can for personal days and yeah. usually do appointments and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of like a morning regimen, I do wake up and meditate every morning. That's been something I've been Very doing nice. for like five years. Um, so I meditate, I sometimes journal, just get my mind right. Uh, and then I try to work out for the most part every morning and uh, doesn't always work, but I am a morning workout kind of person. That's and then cool. I usually head to whatever activity and I'm very diligent. And this is something that I want to tell entrepreneurs too: to be successful. You don't have to work 60, 70, 80 hours. I actually was taught that in order to be successful, you had to do that. But what I've learned, especially as a woman, 
the less I do that, the more money I make. And I think there's a feminine approach to making money that we're not Mm. always aware of. Um, I'm sure a lot of women can understand what I'm saying right now, where there's more ease and relaxation and trusting and, you know, resting so that you're not just grinding and running yourself to exhaustion, which I think a lot of people do suffer from. Right. Um, so I actually am very good. Like I have a lot of spiritual things I do, nights, um, meditation groups I go to. And then I'm very fortunate and blessed where I have a lot of family and friends in LA. So there's always something. You always know, something going always on. Always something. Right? And you live in LA. It's great. There's <laughs> no, if it's not a birthday dinner or this thing or that thing, it's some cool art show or dance thing. So I my if you looked at my calendar, you would see my days are very full, but I don't even think oh, I'm busy. I don't, I don't say that because I actually do enjoy everything I get to do. And of course I have those times where it's maybe more, okay, you know, you're, you're in the, the pace of it. The pace is faster. But you work smart, not hard. Smart. Honestly, the smarter I work, Yeah. which for me, believe it or not, the more I do things outside of my job, exactly. the more things happen. It's almost like my team now knows, Brittany, go out, don't, get out, <laughs> like go, go yeah. rest, go dance, go do something because then things happen. But you know what? You bring up a good point because I think for so long, women tried to mimic men in the way that we did business mm. and we were working 60, 80, a hundred hours a week. And you know, it, it's too much for anyone. Right. And so to be able to balance your life and know that, you know, yes, put in the work and get the grind on, but also equally, make sure that you take care of yourself. So it sounds like to me that you spend time taking care of yourself too. I'm really too. good at it. Yeah, that's good. I've learned to be good. It didn't right. always, it wasn't that way. I had to really unlearn a lot of things. And mm-hmm. even as a woman, how to invest money yes. and time and into time. my personal self-care. But I'm yes. very clear on what that means for me. Right. You know, like weekly massages, which it might sound very extravagant to people. No, but that's for me, move. that's yeah. important. It, it makes is me important. feel better. And, you know, I'm physical and I like to be active or nails or, you know, hair, not feeling guilty. Yes. Like I had to learn how to not feel guilty. And then I think it was just seeing the proof in the pudding. Like I would spend time to do this and then I would get the gig. And I thought, oh, that was weird. I wasn't <laughs> in the office emailing. I wasn't on the phone call. I was actually just out and about right. recharging my battery. So then when I did those emails or those calls, I was more present, more with the person. I was more aware to hear things. And a lot of things in my life, I have attribute to listening yes. and hearing. Like I hear and I hear the opportunities, you know? Well, and so you have much to be of, silent. Because you're not sleepy. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You're not <laughs> you're not tired. Exactly. And I mean, it's so much about when someone decides to or to not do business with you is also the way you make them feel. So if you're in a place that's stressed out and you're burnt out and you don't, you're not your best self, it's Anxious. not going to, yeah, it's not going to reflect well on the client that wants to work with you, right? So, I mean, do you also apply that? I, I see you have a big social media following. Does do you try to project, I would say, what what is it you're trying to project of yourself in your brand on social media? And how do you and how do you use that as a way to get clients? Yeah. So right now it's kind of like in I feel like in a testing period again, mm-hmm. um, which I guess is social media in general. I can't stand people who are fake on social media. Like it mm. really yes. turns me off. For sure. And I think now more than ever, everybody is very aware when someone's fake and turned on and Mm -hmm. slimy like that to me, like my whole body just (laughs) gives me like an intuition. Yeah, for sure. Run, don't do business with that person. So for the most part, I I really try to be authentic, but Mm -hmm. I know there's a level of you know, presentation you have to give. So for example, I have a webinar happening next week and so I'm doing some stories about that. We're trying to keep it fun and light. We put in some memes that are funny. And then I did some videos yesterday where I shared more about, yeah, I used to work 60 hours and think that's how I had to make a lot of money. Now I work Mm -hmm. less than 35 and make a lot of money. So I want to teach you how. And I, you know, I try to just share it from a personal level. Yes. I don't know if it came across that way, you know, but we're always testing strategies. And I think my creative director and I, luckily we're really good friends. So it's also, she, she's like, no, do it again. Or you no, know, you looked really bad right there. That's fake. Like, And we both come from the same place. We don't want to, 
we definitely want business and this is used for business. Mm -hmm. I mean, my social media accounts, I tell everybody, even my personal Facebook is for my business because my personal friends know me in a much more intimate and deep level that they would never look at Facebook to see what's going on with Britney. Like it's not used for that. Um, So I think it's a balance that everybody has to figure out. Yeah, and I think yeah. I think that's, I think that's a great point. And a lot of people who don't do business through social media don't really understand it, you know. And they look at it as like you're just stuck on your phone. Yeah. And what I what I always say, you know, sometimes you know people will be like, "You're always on your phone," you know, your phone. And I was like, "Well, if people were trying to send PayPal's to you on your phone, you'd be on it too." That's right. <laughs> exactly. You know? no, come on, man. Like, I mean, you come see on, the get out of here. Dollars coming in. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's like get out of here with that for real. So uh, yeah, I I, to- I I totally respect that. And so. How would you say if you were to if you were to break it down, though, would you say you have a a lot of your work through the social media or do you think it's like that just is more like build your brand and then you still are very organic in how you find clients? It's a good question. So I think our financial planning clients do tend to come from website, which means in my mind they searched financial planner in L.A. and organically it popped up. And it's because I do social media. It's kind of like this. You put enough seeds out, out and then and it, it leads you to back, back to the source yeah. totally um however we also do get a lot of our personal clients from referrals and professionals like cpas and attorneys mm-hmm. in terms of the brand partnerships and the speaking opportunities mm-hmm. the social media is very important yeah. because people need first of all to know that i'm a speaker and i have these opportunities and then they want to say oh yeah i like this person they have right. a good presence i can relate and i think that all is more geared for that so and I think your marketing is very personable. Thank right? you. Because even this. your, um, when I, I get your emails, and I don't open most of those types of emails because, mm-hmm. like you said, they're very plastic. I'm like, give me a break, leave me alone. I'm mm-hmm. busy, right? But yours are very engaging, very personable. You know, like, hey, how you doing? You know, this is what I'm up to. This is a part of my life, and I think it would be something valuable that, for you to learn too. Why don't you join me on this day? And you can see identified in the email points, bullet points that you can that speak to the person. So mm-hmm. if the person is interested, they'll join you, you know, where others it's just like canned and yours yeah. isn't. So I like that about it. Oh, I'm so glad to hear this feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any ways we can improve? You know what? I like them. I, okay. I do. I love them because, like I said, they're personable Okay. and they're interactive. So, you know, yeah. when you look at it, you see the bullet points and you go, OK, this is me. Mm. Okay, let me join her. Let me check her out. Let me see what she's doing. I love that. So I like. I'm gonna that. relay that to Jessica. We good. We're always Shout asking for Shout out to feedback. Jessica. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I also wanted to know, like, within your your um, social media brand, did you decide I'm gonna use I'm gonna use these three social media outlets, or did it just happen organically? When I first started, I actually used LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. First and foremost, mm-hmm. that's how I set up all these coffee meetings with people just to build my network. I was in just LA. preaching right. about LinkedIn on LinkedIn. the last episode. I it's, was like, get your LinkedIn up. Yes. It's so cool. I remember that was my first thing. I built my network in LA from, hey, I saw you're a professional in LA. I'd love to connect. Let's have coffee. And then that helped me get my name out. Mm-hmm. Since then, I think Facebook and Instagram is where we spend most of our time, mainly yes. because of our target market seems to be there the most. Twitter, I've always seen as the um financial industry like Mm -hmm. a lot of financial people follow me on twitter Mm -hmm. um but in terms of getting clients and brands i think facebook and instagram and and mainly i probably because of the ads Mm -hmm. which we haven't done yet but we're going to try to do this year that's cool cool. so when we come back we're going to talk a little bit more about that I have Brittany Castro in the studio. I don't want to let her go. I want her to just stay, stay, I stay. I want to stay forever. <laughs> <laughs> and so DJ Bander will be right back. Sounds good. And this is Charlene on Lunch with the Finance Bunch with my co-host over here, DJ Bander. Hello, hello. And we have the wonderful Brittany Castro in the office here. And we decided that we're not going to let her leave. She's going to be in the studio with us forever. I'm so in. I can't wait. (laughs) Right? So we were talking about your social media and how you reach out to new customers and also keep in contact with old and which media outlets you use. So I wanted to explore that more. So I know you're on Instagram and Facebook a lot. And in fact, Gary V talked about you in his book because of your presence on Facebook. So mm-hmm. let's talk about the Facebook strategy a little bit. Because you know what, Brittany, honestly, I 
me and these millennials, we get into it because they don't find as much value in Facebook as I do. So maybe this is where I'll gain some validity. Interesting. Okay. Yes. So Facebook, yeah, we actually have our business page. And then also we created a private group um, just where I do Facebook lives every mm -hmm. week. I try to do it and put content in there. Um, so if you're interested, we'd love to have you in our Facebook group. If you just go to Financially Wise Inc., you'll see the group and we'll accept you in once you hit <laughs> request to join group. She's going to drop that accept. <laughs> okay, perfect. I'll drop the exception. Um, yeah, Facebook's great. And then, you know, for those lives, I really yes. like doing Facebook lives because they stay, whereas mm -hmm. Instagram, you know, the stories always go away yes. and the lives go away. Um, but also if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can do that too. And it's Brittany Castro. And on Instagram, I feel like we try to really promote things that are happening where mm -hmm. I'm at, mm -hmm. our services, but also like right now we're doing a 30 day money challenge I to make that. it relatable. And That's all those, cool. ch all those things I came up with, like, what do I do and how like legit I've gone to the farmer's market every week this month. And I feel super proud of myself, <laughs> you know, to cut back on food Eating costs and, and yeah. also to get more healthy with my food and so it's very personal it's really I always take what I'm experiencing or hearing and push it out into the content so do you feel like your brand is more of not just a financial brand but a lifestyle brand we're always trying to okay say that that's what yeah I from it. Uh -huh. and originally when I started the company I said I want to be more than just a finance brand I, and whether you call it financial wellness or holistic you know it, it's all about that because I just see it's all connected. It is. Health and wealth are definitely connected. Health and wealth. And I think health, if you're not healthy, I mean, that is one area of wealth. And I learned that very yeah. specifically last year. I had my own stuff I went through health-wise. And I just thought, wow, I have a whole different appreciation for being healthy and for sure. what that means. Exactly. Now, Brittany, we have so many questions for you, and I'm not even going to go down the litany of questions that I didn't get to ask you. We'll so probably have to have her back. We have I to have her back. back. So I want you to promise <laughs> us that you will come back and I visit us again. I will for sure. <laughs> That's what's so up. I want you to take the time right now before we end this to give us all of the ways we can contact you one more time. Yes. Yeah, so go to financiallywiseinc.com. Number one, you'll see everything we do and offer and all our contact information there. Follow me on Instagram, Brittany Castro. Um, join the Facebook group, Financially Wise Inc. I think those are three solid Ways. call to action. Definitely, definitely. Um, and, you know, I also tell everybody, if you direct message us, we literally respond to every email, every direct message, everything. So don't be afraid. Even if you just, like, we try to ask a lot of questions, we read them all. Yeah. Um, I think it's important. You know, I think that's the part of social media. Everybody is more accessible. So don't don't be shy. That's it. I love it. And by the way, make sure all of our listeners be sure to follow us as well so you can get in contact with Brittany as well at The Finance Bunch on Instagram and at DJ Bander for your boy over here. Looking forward to seeing everybody and everybody check in and ask some more questions, you know? Absolutely. You can yeah. check us out on YouTube also. Oh, that's the most check important. Get on that on YouTube. YouTube. Yes. Google The Finance Bunch. Heck yeah. So Brittany, again, I want to thank you for coming in. This has been yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. This has been great. I really enjoy you both. I'm so happy you're doing this and educating people. Thanks for the support. Thank you. Yeah. This is Charlene. And this is DJ Bander. And we'll see you next time on Tuesdays at noon on, on Dash, Dash Talk, Talk X. X. Thank you for watching, everyone. Be sure to find us on Instagram at The Finance Bunch. And listen to us every Tuesday on Dash Talk X.